Hello, everyone, and welcome. We'll get started shortly. I'd love to know where people are zooming in from. I'd love to know where everyone is located. I know we have a group of panelists from dis different places as well. Um, all right. We'll get started in a moment. Okay. Yeah, feel free to say in the chat where you're where you're from. Okay. All right. Thank you all for joining us tonight for Poetry as Curiosity, Off the Page and Into the World. My name is Kathleen Woods and I am a uh, library assistant at the Pacifica Sharp Park Library, as well as the author of the novel, White Wedding. I'm excited to join San Mateo County Libraries and Foglifter to celebrate National Poetry Month by welcoming four incredible poets, Kanika Argawal, Mia Ayumi Amalhotra, Johnny Rajawa and Dior J. Stevens for a reading and conversation about how curiosity impacts their work. Um, before we begin, I want to let you know that on Thursday, April 20th, SMCL will host Alka Joshi for a presentation about her newest book, The Perfumist of Paris. We will also be hosting um, a virtual reading by Foster City poets, so poets with some kind of connection to the city of Foster City, on Saturday, April 29th. And we hope to see you there at both those events. Um, as for tonight's logistics, your microphone and video will be turned off, but please feel free to use the chat and submit your questions in the Zoom Q&A. Uh, for those who'd like to access live closed captions for this event, click on CC and then show subtitle. And then we will begin with short readings and move on to a discussion. And I am thrilled to introduce our first reader, Kanika Argwal. Mika Argwal is a queer Indian writer and mad diasporic hybrid developed across six countries on four continents. She holds a double BS in biology and writing from MIT, an MFA in writing from Columbia University, and a PhD in English and literary arts from the University of Denver. She's, a fiction, ed she's fiction editor at Corio, a quarterly magazine of immigrant and diaspora speculative fiction, and hybrid nonfiction editor at Foglifter. Her own work appears or is forthcoming in Best American Experimental Writing 2020, Black Warrior Review, Folder, Sand, The Texas Review, and various SF and F publications. Kanika has received fellowships from the Degrassi Resident Artist Program, McDowell, and the Vermont Studio Center. She lives in Denver, Colorado with her senior toy Fox Terrier. You can also find her online at antiquarchic.com and twitter.com slash antiquarchic, which is something about physics that I don't understand, which is very exciting. <laughs> Thank you and welcome. <laughs> Thank you, Katie. Um, uh, actually, a very big thank you to Katie for um, setting all of this up. I am so grateful to be here with these very distinguished panelists. Um, and thank you um, to the attendees for taking time uh, from what I'm sure is a very busy week. Um, I'm going to read uh, one short piece and then an excerpt from a um, work in progress. The first piece is called Border um, and was just uh, is was just published in the most recent issue of the Texas Review. Border. I waited so long I was near forgetting, slipping out of my time. Your number's up. I rose in waveform and moved to the front. My unstitched garment and penumbra were confiscated. This is the border, I tried to explain, starting from the edges, and this the fall, as if words here could say what they meant. I dropped my name for examination, unfastened, lay like a tongue. Hold. All that light work, the fineness of the hand. 
What's the measure of resistance? I had prepared until senseless, searching as a question the other face of each office. In the final, I performed an accurate, brief, comprehensive reenactment of my prior tragedies and transgressions. Every eye remained dry. But lo, from the cabinet of destiny, a flag to plant in my breast. I went on to collect my new arrangement at the end of my tether, made a display for the pleasure of the citizenry. Further, where I crossed a line, the border closed around me, blooming. Um, and the second piece is an excerpt from a work in progress titled Liar. That's L-I-E-R, um, a, a play, of course, on L-I-A-R, liar, and also L-Y-R-E, the liar of um, lyric poetry. Um, and this work is very much in engagement with, um, uh, with ideas about um, value, productivity, um, action versus inaction, and the language of the Paperwork Reduction Act, um, which I am reminded of every time I have to fill out these extensive forms uh, for immigration-related purposes. From Liar. Nothing moves me. I lie in myself like a grave, root inside. Its shape takes place in me. It shakes my haptics. What is it? Nothing, a clearance. In my first reduction act, I set time aside, unburdened the hours. I spread across the zones. I fill all forms as needed. When I become your phantom other, I wax mathematic. Every square is a rectangle, but every rectangle is not aware. From here I see both sides. I am the remainder of what was divided. I deposit myself. I exact an acknowledgement of my interests, material, non-material. It is said one cannot possess all properties, but who is saying it? Who let you in? What is the purpose of your form? Is it a person? Tell me, I'll take it lying down. It is said one cannot express all properties. Attachment is when, one, is when more than one alien is included in the form. Who let you out? Okay, and it is now my pleasure to introduce the next reader. Mia Ayumi Malhotra is the author of Notes from the Birth Year, winner of the Bato Press Boom Chap Book Contest, and Isako Isako, a California Book Award finalist and winner of the Alice James Award, the Nautilus Gold Award, a National Indie Excellence Award, and a Maine Literary Award. She is the recipient of the Hawker Prize for Southeast Asian Poetry and the Singapore Poetry Prize, and her poems have appeared in numerous journals and anthologies, including the Yale Review, Indiana Review, and The World I Leave You, Asian American Poets on Faith and Spirit. Thank you so much, Kanika, and thank you to Katie um, and the entire team um, for putting this marvelous event together. Um, I'm just going to share two, two short poems. Um, these are from my, um, my forthcoming collection, um, Mother Salt. Um, it'll be out from Alice James Books um, in May 2025. I just got the good news um, this past week. Um, so I'm excited to share to share these pieces with you. Um, and in the interest of time, I'm going to skip the first few lines of this first poem, which is where poems come from. So apologies to our interpreters. I'm going <laughs> to uh, mess up the plan a little bit, but anyway. 
this is uh, where poems come from, and it's dedicated to, to my daughters. Entering the aviary, you saw it first, a dabbling teal, scarcely distinguishable from foliage. Duck, I said, and pointed, quacked, and like that it was gone. Her language dawned slowly, then all at once, the dry, whitish lid working its way reptile-like up the bird's eye. This isn't really about the duck, the pointing. The point is that I saw you seeing a creature for the first time, paused motionless on the bridge, bits of debris shifting underfoot. Every day you make some new utterance, ball, more, meow, closing the space between the world you live in and your name for it. Surprise, hunger, spoon. Or maybe this is about the duck, you, me, that dappled afternoon, the tender wrecked moment before the duck was a duck, when it was nothing but a whiff of smoke blown across water, which all of us were once. One time you saw a duck on a pond, a green-winged teal, and it was the first time such a thing ever existed, light startled off its back as it slid noiselessly across the water, bill riffling beneath the surface, turning this way, that, searching for something to eat, something we could not see, but knew all the same was there. And I think that might be the opening poem of the, of the book, if things stay as are. <laughs> Um, and this next poem is a part of a, um, a, a longer sequence of poems all entitled Dear Body. What if inside this story is another story, just as inside every mother is a child and a child inside her and still another nested forms reaching through time. She lost a baby before me, also a sister. When I was born, she counted my fingers and toes, and then she wept to see me alive. She looked down at me, cradled in her arms, and I was beautiful. It's the light, she remembers, she says, the slow, wonder-filled hours. After giving birth, I woke every night soaked in milk, the front of my nightgown, the sheets, damp stains on cotton, a shape that spreads the shape of her story, which I lived in but had no words for, though I wore it like a second skin. We who begin in this way, surely we can taste it, the tang of melancholy seeping through amniotic fluid. Her body bent over the sewing machine and me stirring inside, stitched from bone from the pound and yammer of machinery, ravenous eating down the miles of grief. Difficult beauty, they say, takes time. What happens next is never ours to say. Um, and now it's my distinct pleasure um, to introduce um, Shani Randawa to you. Um, they're just such a fabulous person. I've enjoyed collaborating on this panel so much because of Shani's amazing grace and just generosity of spirit. So it's, it's such a gift to inhabit this space together with, <laughs> with you, Jani. Um, so Jani uh, Rondawa, they, them, is a Kenyan Punjabi Anglo-American collaborator and multidisciplinary maker, co-founding editor of the experimental arts publication Rivulet and author of Time Regime, um, which is out um, as of last year on Gaudy Boy Press, an amazing Singaporean um, publishing, <laughs> publishing company. Um, this book was selected as a finalist for the 2023 California Book Awards. Um, and Jani has studied at Upaya Zen Center and Green Gulch Farm Zen Center, and has participated in artist residencies at Blue Mountain Center, Writers House Pittsburgh, Malay Arts, and the Worm Farm Institute. Their work has appeared or is forthcoming in the Decan and Phonograph Editions Hybrid Literature Anthology, Obod, ASAP J, the Poetry Project, Figure One, Soap Ear, the Sika Museum in Gyeonggi-do, South Korea, Cal State Bakersfield, um, Todd Madigan Gallery, the Mealy Arts, and the Woolen Mill Gallery, among others. In 2023, Johnny will begin graduate studies at the University of London, um, SOAS, which I'm very 
jealous about. <laughs> um, you can learn more about Jani and their work at um, jfkrandawa.com. Everyone, let's welcome uh, the amazing Jani. Yeah, thank you so much. Um, I'm deeply moved and it has been an honor and a joy to be in this process with all of you, um, Kanika, Mia, Dior, Kathleen um, at SMCL, um, Charlie and Misha and everyone at Foglifter. Thank you for organizing us and bringing your wonder to this space. Thank you to Valerie and Nikki for your interpretation as well. Um, I'm going to read uh, an excerpt of an excerpt of a chapter of my book-length work in progress. Um, the excerpt, which I'm calling Paradise, moves between forms um, through prose, poetry, spell, torn edge, map, dream. And this excerpt is now actually out um, in the amazing new publication 128 Lit. Um, and something that came to mind actually from um, Mia and Kanika, both of your readings. Um, Mia, you're, you're, you started with um, where poems come from as an idea. And Kanika, you um, had the word unstitched. And I feel like this kind of, uh, uh, this kind of nebulous space, uh, the space of undoing and remaking and being form and formless is something I'm thinking about. Um, a little bit in certain ways in this excerpt. The person standing before me has long, agile fingers that splay when she's finding the story, exasperated, calcified expressions of two wrists once broken. She has thick, wiry hair that shrinks and fuzzes in humidity, raw eyelids, unrelenting eczema, vowels that sit soft and low in the stone of her throat. She can regale you with telephone numbers, local, international, that she has dialed since the 1960s with a dismissive laugh. She can describe in great detail the daily habits and movements and ailments of any aunt, uncle, or cousin across the planet. Standing before me, she is electric, a fumeral, pleading and rough, scratching. Some days I am so depressed. Kitjia jia, she says in English. Refusing to be clean, to be correct, to bear it. She is an alchemist, her materials doubt and a body's witness. On any given day, I write a poem. Ultimately, it is the same poem, one of visitation, of women dancing in a bone-littered dreamscape, of a world undone and remade after cataclysm. Before, maybe I wrote the stone of the sky again, Today flesh puckering and wadded into cavity. Of rotted oak I've strung with fiber. Our loom, our endurance arena. A towel coiled there to soothe bone and bone, weakened by impacts. Above is red rain. And I am run run cold sky in the same way. When we crouched humid in spring tectonics. Of wet metal, her body health scheme, calling agitated. Dreams of a tiger, soft and gold white foot of her bed, I am silent in the same way I was then, cupping that earth to my mouth noisy and full as flowers, hunting the tiger, my knees, the scab sport for a wave of red sound on bondage on changeling, on subducted surface. I am waiting for you to imagine me, call out 
unbury with your gathering storm. Thank you. And it is now my distinct pleasure to introduce the amazing poet, Dior J. Stevens. Dior J. Stevens is a proud Pisces, hailing from Midwestern waters. He is the author of the chapbooks, Screams and Lavender, 001, and Canon. Their debut full-length collection, Cruel Cruel, was published this spring with Night Boat Books. They are the managing poetry editor of Foglifter Journal and Press, who is co-presenting this event right now. So thank you, Dior, for being here. They tweet at, at Dolphin Neptune and Instagram at, at Dolphin Photos. Dior, the floor is yours. Thank you so much. Thank you so much, Danny. Thank you for that incredible introduction. Thanks to Katie and everyone at SMCL for having us here tonight. Thank you to my fellow co-readers. And of course, a big shout out to Foglifter, especially Misha and Charlie for helping this all come together. And of course, to all of our attendees here tonight. Thank you for joining us. I'm going to share two pieces with everyone tonight. One from my debut, Cruel Cruel, and something new, which is fun for me. So I'll just get right into it. This first one is titled, Untitled Yellow Piece, number nine. Fly by brandy, mixed calluses, asking for a highball, just chatting politics, just listening to white cries on black parades, just lifting lug legs, dumbbells round my Jim Crow ankles, just sliding, just assembling roses for the next funeral I won't be able to attend. Just when you feel the need for heart palpitations, just step outside. Just enhancing my melanin, just wondering where God drinks, just having another, an other, other off day. Just breathing in dragon, steaming out snow, just slow breaths. Poet of the current, how do you swim? We don't. Just brothers I'll never meet, just brothers trying to see sunrise. Just clouds, just rampades just off the TV, just silence, respite for us, just silence. You, where is your just voice? Told myself I'd sit outside today as long as necessary, but the whole block is hot with grieving, shovels scooped up full of dog shit, Peach trees pitying their blisters. Can only depend on the sun as much as I depend on Black Death, which is to say, with utmost certainty, just a small chance, small, of absolute obliteration. Um, my next and final piece to share with everybody tonight is a newer piece. First time reading this. This is from a new series I've been working on. It's fun to write new things sometimes. Is sometimes yes. Sometimes there were bags of wealth thrown at a Swiss hold heart, at flash struck eyes. Sometimes a mountain of snow made a face for itself, left to search through a pool of mirrors for recalibration. Even water couldn't fashion. Sometimes the tongue shared right into the bloodstream, a holiest form of devotion, cloth stripped bodies and kaleidoscope glow and a hollow hallway of touches. Sometimes the mind flurries back to pockets of dis-dazed remembrance, the vortex of serenity that can only be found in boom-based chaos, virility and sweat. 
listen here, it don't take much to make a grown man cry. And it is my distinct pleasure to pass things back to Katie to open up for our question section of the evening. Wonderful. Thank you so much, everyone. It was very beautiful. And I don't know, I just am very grateful to have heard all of this wonderful poetry here tonight and to have you all here. And now to get to hear some more of your brilliance in this conversation. Um, so yes, please, everyone, um, if you have any questions for our panelists, feel free to put them in the Q&A. Um, I have some questions to start us off. And in fact, I'm going to kind of add on a question from the Q&A to my first question because it's re related. Um, my question was just to start with the basics and to ask um, how you all view the relationship between poetry and curiosity. Um, but an attendant has added onto this, what does it mean to ask questions through poetry? When do you begin to answer instead of ask in your poems? Um, which, you know, you can answer any parts of those that you, that, that you wish. I'd love to hear from anyone, anyone who feels inspired to answer. <laughs> answer instead of ask in this panel. <laughs> All right, I'll jump in then. Um, <clears throat> I, um, I think that, um, um, you know, I, I, I studied um, biology when I was um, younger and had thought I would have a career as a scientist um, before I derailed that. Um, so, um, and, and I don't necessarily see a difference in um, the kinds of questions I ask, um, you know, now versus, versus then. Um, but of course, you know, once you get beyond the, uh, the initial asking, right? Um, I think, for example, um, as a biologist, um, you're paying this very close attention to your subject or question of inquiry, um, but then what emerges from that that becomes available to the, the recipient or of that um, is formed more as a kind of um, answer or information or, or knowledge. Um, I think what to me is really exciting about poetry is that um, what emerges from the questioning is this ongoing shaping of attention um, and um, kind of, you know, um, the questions that emerge out of the questions. And for me, if there are any answers, um, they come from the engagement between um, the writer, the work, and the reader or audience. Um, I'm not attempting to answer anything myself, really. Um, I can jump in as well. Um... And I, I love the question about the relationship between poetry and curiosity, because for me, that just goes straight to the heart of um, what, what brings me to, to writing in the first place. Um, so many of my, my poems or my book projects um, begin with a, with, a, with a kind of ache or an uncertainty or um, like an awareness of like something not lining up with something else which uh you know can lead to a form of despair or you know or or it can give rise to a kind of curiosity which to me I suppose is the way that I have come to um as a as an artist but also as a as a human right as as my way through um these these gaps and these fissures that um are you know, present in ways that I think about my identity, um, what it means to have grown up transnationally, um, to have never really felt like I belonged anywhere, to have, you know, carried a passport that didn't 
you know, that didn't place me <laughs> um, anywhere that I saw around me. Um, and then, you know, here in the U.S. as um, as someone who is the descendant of of Japanese Americans, who you know, th there are just there are so many cracks in history, uh, and and I'm just scraping the surface <laughs> here. Um, so, I I mean to to relate it, I guess to to my my work in particular, um, I would say that the the poems that I wrote in my first book were my way to explore, you know, like who who am I? How do I hold these pieces together when, you know, it just it looks like the globe fragmented in all of these different ways? And how do I how do I bring it together? You know, how do I bring a childhood in Laos with an adolescence in Thailand with um, like a family history in Japan with, you know, displacement in in California like how do I hold these things together and how do I hold these different experiences generationally together um if if without the holding and the curiosity that sort of stitched these things together um if without all of that it would just all fly apart um and I like that um Kanaka you talked about your um your background as a um <laughs> as a person studying biology um because I I've been looking a lot into um, sort of the dynamics, you know, on, on an atomic level, like all matter is arranged around this, like this void, you know, at the center of every atom, there are these little particles, but really it's just, it's just a lot of space. So how else to inter interact with that, except with curiosity, otherwise it all flies apart. <laughs> and then where, where are we? Um, but anyway, I'll, I'll open it up to whomever else has a response. I'm sure we all do. I can jump in here. Um, I really loved Kanika when you mentioned questions that emerge from other questions. Questioning for me is such a central part of my poetic practice. And I think I've learned as I've, you know, progressed through my own journey in poetry and writing that I don't know if I know any un or non-curious poets. I think for us, poetry is a sort of praxis in which we view and perceive the world. It can be something as minute and seemingly inconsequential is noticing a gnat land on a leaf in the park and wondering how that gnat got there, how that gnat moves, what its journey has been to something, you know, larger to some of the concerns like Mia is mentioning here, socio-political, personal identity concerns that have so much room for questions, right? I think that's one of the great wonders of poetry is that it's one of the most welcoming artistic spaces to questioning and to also not always having to, you know, maybe again, kind of can speak to this or does this a bit more, but, you know, science really seeks to answer a lot of questions, which we are thankful for because we need those answers. Um, but I think poetry revels in the uncertainty a bit more, uh, actually quite a bit more, which is something I personally really appreciate about poetry. It's not always about the answer. It's about the question. What is the question? And what is the formation of the question, the origin of that question, and the implications of the question? So to be curious for me is one of our greatest gifts as poets. Yeah. I feel uh feel like you've all answered really this this question, but I'm I'm uh I'm so interested in uh in the space around and we talked about uh we talked about giving room giving space a little bit um and Kanika you said something about shaping attention by uh following the question deeper and deeper um I I don't think that I ever get to a point where I'm answering um because then uh uh I don't know if I believe in answers. <laughs> I don't know if I believe in completion necessarily as like a even a formal process. So or even in just process. Um some my body moves and something happens in the atmosphere. And I will not perceive what happens, but it doesn't end with me and my answer. Um so I that's something that I'm I'm thinking about as. I'm, I'm hearing and synthesizing and kind of processing what you've all shared. Um, I think for me also just in my poetic practice, 
continuing that kind of uh, continuing to be in the space and kind of uh, find how my uh, the form of the language or the grammar of my attention is uh, maybe uh, moving and shifting, taking up space, diminishing is is something I'm interested in. Um, and well, I'll have be ever curious about. Wonderful. I was really hearing a lot of almost in everyone's answer, I think, words of attention, um, thinking about, yeah, noticing. Um, Kanika, you said uh, the ongoing shaping of attention is something that you feel like happens in poetry. Um, um, Dior, you talked about noticing and curiosity and attention, the grammar of attention, Johnny, you just said too. I wonder if um, there are times um, when you've felt that that sort of art fueling life giving force of curiosity was more difficult to access and maybe ways that you were able to return to practices of attention um, and to sort of revive that curiosity. I know that's something I myself as a writer, though I write fiction, you know, still, uh, I still am very driven by questions. And I think that sometimes it, even um, those of us who write all the time or try to make writing um, part of our working lives, they can sometimes, those core values can get away from us. So I'd be interested to know if you have any practices of bringing curiosity and attention um, back into your practice. Yeah. Practices bring them back into your practices. You know what I'm asking. Okay. <laughs> yeah, I can respond to this one um, because th there's a very specific moment in time in which I felt my um, my observational practice and my creative practice to sort of like fly apart into a thousand pieces in a way that felt <laughs> irretrievable. Um, and that was um, probably March 2020, um, when all of a sudden I realized, oh, my children will be home from school indefinitely. My partner will be inhabiting our home office indefinitely, which, you know, is ordinarily my writing studio. Um, and all of life just sort of got folded and stacked and compressed. Um, and there, I mean, I had had that year set aside um, to revise to revise a book manuscript. Um, I was looking forward to long spells of <laughs> uninterrupted attention um, during which I could be curious about my own process. But instead, I was curious about things like how am I going to survive with um, with family life? Um, and um, I, mean, I don't need to go on about that. We all have our own <laughs> our own journey that we sort of went through with that that spring and the, the years that followed. Um, but I, I bring that up now because um, I've never before experienced um, the sort of like complete collapse of, um, of an art practice, but then the like the rebuilding incrementally um, of one. And what I, what I realized um, as, the, as the month sort of went on um, was that curiosity, observation, like these things don't live in our in our notebooks and our published works and our accolades and the you know the things that we we point to and say I made that I did that like this this life it, it, it lives inside of us and with strange constraints like I don't know homeschooling children and you know all that it's like it it, it just it finds other forms um and so I, I discovered that I was becoming curious, maybe out of necessity. I think curiosity lets us, like I was saying earlier, like it's maybe sometimes the only way through. Um, I was becoming curious about, you know, dailiness and um, plant life and other beings around me. So I started um, a sketchbook practice. Um, it started intersecting with my reading practice. So. I mean, I didn't have time to sit down and work on poems, but I had time to somehow, like, I don't know, that felt less threatening to my children for some reason, for me to like sit down and sketch them or sketch, you know, whatever plants, plant specimens we had gathered on our walk, you know? Um, so I found attention taking very different 
forms um, and found myself curious about what was around me in ways that I hadn't been in a long time. Um, and the making kind of came, came out of that. And um, I think since life has sort of returned to some of its um, original cadences of, you know, children go to school, I do have time. Um, I've, I've discovered that there's like that, that life of inner sort of attending to an observation, like it, it, it remains intact, actually, even though the form is different now, and um, I have more focused ways um, that I'm making and reading and writing and responding. Um, that's my story. I don't know if there are there specific moments for other people or if you have more general experiences um, around this question. I think I can jump in after you, Mia. I um, I think I kind of heard maybe what my answer was going to be a bit from listening to you, which was I, I think it's, um, I don't know, I think it's more common than you think to like kind of get into these spaces of losing a bit of, not necessarily curiosity, but a certain brightness and levity and just sort of like, I don't know, newness of the curiosity. So I actually really appreciate it. I believe it was Johnny earlier in their bio who mentioned um, multidisciplinary and I'm also using a very similar term a lot of the time. I'm a very interdisciplinary artist and have been trained to be so for quite some time. So whenever I'm feeling very stuck or you know, un, unbright, dim in that sort of way. I just have to go into another medium. And I think that's just something that poetry does so well it is um, it partners with other mediums exceedingly well. Um, for me, it's usually um, visual arts. So you can see it behind me, mixed media work. It can also be dance and movement work and performance art, um, but and photography, um, film work, but any of those things, if I just step out of language a bit, as much as I can, and move into, again, the visual, into the body, into communication, it doesn't involve language in that way, I almost always can come back to that sort of like wonder of curiosity and wanting to know more and wanting to write through those questions to learn more, um, but it's almost always Dior has stepped out of language. So sorry, I think I'm bad. <laughs> I, think, I don't know what's going on with my internet here, friends, but thank you for bearing with me. Um, I was mostly done anyway. Um, just stepping out into other mediums is a huge success for me. Love the idea of Zoom failing as, yeah, kind of, kind of saying stepping out of language <laughs> that Zoom forces us to at times, right? <laughs> Do you have any other uh, thoughts about this question? Of course, it's okay. If not, any things you find helpful for revitalizing? I think um, you know, we've heard questions like different words to describe curiosity, and I've noticed them it both being described as like an ache and as awe. So I guess like from moving that ache into awe, uh, maybe even, yeah. <laughs> I can move on to the next question. We can always circle back to, okay. So I had a question similar to this, but I prefer the way an attendee uh, named this in their Q and A. So please do bring your own curiosity to us in the Q and A. Um, all right, what are your poetic obsessions? Have they changed over time? What are your poetic obsessions? Have they changed over time? I'm happy to start this one. Um, I also am uh, just like feel like a sponge um, absorbing Mia and Dior, what you just shared about um, the, the practices of, of shifting um, how curiosity shifts and how also practice um, moves um, and how that's revitalizing. So I'm just like, just want to hear you talk about it all the time <laughs> just to feel inspired um i think a uh, uh, poetic obsessions um it's 
uh, let's see. I wanted to speak about a poetic obsession that I have um, now, I think, which is um, which is actually kind of around um, this is it's like a partnered obsession with a few other friends of mine around dance notation. Um, how do we or dance as a as a form as a medium um, is meant to be uh, inhabited in the body, and its uh, its choreo choreography is something that is um, mirrored and shared physically. And so um, thinking about how we uh, make notation onto the page um, around around movement. And um, I think earlier I said something about the grammar of attention. Um, what I also maybe mean by that too is the, uh, the, the grammar of the body moving onto the page. Um, what are these like really subtle, um, what are these really subtle methods of communicating um, shape and breath, muscular, um, like micro movements? I'm just like very obsessed with that right now. I find it to be, um, I find it to be a question that does not have answers, like <laughs> to, to link back to um, uh, one of the audience members' great questions earlier. So that's that's something I'm really thinking about right now. Um, I'm also really thinking about um, how that also links to um, how these kinds of forms of the body in motion, how that also can be uh, be a kind of practice or or maybe a strategy for communicating uh, relation toward ecological futures. Um, how are our bodies physically in motion with other um, ecological forces? How can we open our bodies to that relation? And how do we get that onto the page? I'm like so curious. <laughs> Um, I think all of your works are doing that too. So I'm in I'm in a study um, of of all of you. So I'll stop. I'll pause there and let other folks jump in. Yoshoni was just talking about um, different kinds of relations and the ecological forces um, in relation with perhaps more uh, something that feels more individual or graspable in some way. Um, yeah, I would, I think scale and, and the, the interactions between and across um, things happening on different scales is something that um, I'm very interested in. Um, it, the the kind of biology I studied was largely cellular and molecular biology. So um, I'm often thinking about the kinds of things that are happening um, in all um, living organisms um, at the cellular molecular level and you know, what are the relationships between what's happening on that scale and things that are happening on other scales, whether actual relationships or metaphorical relationships. Um, and I find that for me, you know, the obsession will often begin with like um, a particular uh, a particular phrase off, often coming from, um, uh, scientific language, like model organisms, for example, or um, discontinuous replication. Um, and then sort of thinking about, you know, the very specific thing that means in a scientific context, and then how you sort of loosen that language, right, and uh, make it more... Um, make it available 
to think about other things beyond, you know, whatever the specific thing that um, it's pinned to when scientists are using that language. Um, so yeah, traveling across different scales and maybe even planes of um, being. That's so inspiring. I love that. <laughs> and I love I love the um the the variety of of obsessions also that we're that we're bringing into um into this space. Um I feel like though our interests or um I mean honestly our obsessions um you know can be indexed across all these different disciplines. It's almost like the structure of our engagement with them. I, I don't know. I just felt such a resonance, Kanika, and what, what you were describing and like how you loosen the language and, and um I'm like that's 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 exactly what I've been, been doing. Um because one of my recent obsessions um actually is uh the the pipe organ. Um I've been so fascinated and been doing a lot of um, research into um, sometimes very on a, like talking about scale, right? A very, very like minute level, like what is the anatomy of the mouth, the tongue, the ears, the beard? It's called the beard, the, the tiny little roll <laughs> carved like, um, it's, it's wood placed underneath the lip of the, of the like the pipe. It's, it's just such metaphorical, but also very technical. Um, language and I think for me this is an obsession that has sort of grown and um, just sort of um, morphed to lots of different scales of being and experience um, because I think fundamentally what I'm sort of driven by is this question like what does it mean maybe this is related to like what does it mean to <laughs> to notate dance, like physical movement. Like, I'm like, what does it mean that there's this unseen world, you know, this world of sound that's produced by this incredible architecture of, you know, pipe and flute and reed and even like cathedral space, because it's the actual resonance of the space itself, you know, that creates the sound. Um, what does it mean that this, like, this whole invisible, unseen, unseeable world, um, is present, but it's outside of language. It's outside. I mean, we we try and describe it, but it's all metaphorical. Um, and then I don't know. I guess I've just been wondering, like, what what are all of the different layers of metaphor that can reveal themselves if we start thinking about, you know, how things vibrate in response to other things. How that's actually what resonance is. Um, what does this mean, you know, in, in relation to the cosmos, you know, and, and these are very, very old questions. So I've been reading a lot of Kepler and Copernicus and Galileo, you know, it's sort of like the questions just latch on to many other people's historic questions, um, and open into lots of other rabbit holes. And it's, it's a kind of pleasure, I think, to engage, um, in, in this work, um, because, because there are answers that maybe are like provisional answers, but there's always something bigger and another layer to bring in or a way to scale it like into the interior space, like the invisible inside that we hold and then to make it really big into, um, into space. I don't know. There, yeah, there's so many, <laughs> so many joys. Um, just research and, and learning what else what else can I can I can I be curious about this is re reminding me just how much I love listening to other people's current obsessions and what <laughs> they're thinking about do it under minute this is a minute detail um I don't know if there's anything else anyone wants to add here our obsessions um it's also very interesting to me here some similarities between across the group of thinking about physicality, thinking about like the space between physical beings, thinking about physicalizing language at the same time. I don't know. It's been really interesting to, to hear various. Then we, we've circled around um, like music and dance often as well, which I think is also fascinating. Um, I, we have a few minutes, just a few minutes left. I wanted to say, uh, give 
the panelists an opportunity to ask each other questions if you have any. If you do not have any questions for each other, that is okay, because I can have I have one last question anyway, but give you a minute to think about it. <laughs> okay. Um, all right. If not, I would love to know in our last couple minutes if there is um, another poet whose work really excites you, makes you even more um, curious about the possibilities of poetry. Is something is someone you're reading who is keeping your yeah is just someone you would recommend to anyone who wants to continue to deepen their exploration of of poetry. A reading list we can develop for our audience here. Um, I would like to recommend um, a poet who um, is also a friend, um, but I promise I'm not biased about this. Uh, <laughs> um, that poet is Aditi Machado, um, and I will put her name in chat as well. Um, incredibly exciting work. Um, she has a couple of books out and we'll have um, another book out next year, I think. Um, and, and Dior knows her as well and is enthusiastically agreeing with me. Thank you, Dior. Uh, <laughs> yeah, that, that's my recommendation. Um, I'm going to add two names to our list. Um, the first is Meg Day, whose work and being I adore. Um, and then the second is Joyelle McSweeney, um, whose work is just a terror and an astonishment. And um, I've I've been reading um, her most recent book um, recently, just letting it absorb. It's it's a lot to take in. I will type both of those names into the chat. Um, I'm happy to jump in. Connie, I'm really glad you mentioned Aditi. Aditi is incredible. Um, and actually the person, the poet I'm going to share, I was introduced to via a class, a course with Aditi. And um, this is Akila Oliver, a poet who is no longer with us, a Black queer poet writing in, I believe, the 90s and 2000s. Um, this book particularly is the She Said Dialogues, Flesh, Memory. Um, really, re I have it right here always, just really changed the game for me in a lot of ways. Uh, so another great poet suggesting more great poets. The train continues. Thanks to Odyssey, the big one. And I'll also type this in the chat. Oh my gosh, I'm so excited to read these people's works. Um, and Katie, when you asked if we had questions for other panelists, I just want to say I want to just hang out with y'all and just chat all the time. <laughs> You're all brilliant. And I just like honored to be your student. <laughs> um, uh, I think there I had like this whole list of people, Katie, when you when I uh, returned to this question. Um, but I'm I'm feeling really compelled today to lift up two voices. Um, uh, one, the first poet is um, Gabrielle Octavia Rucker, whose book just came out from the Song Cave. It's um, dereliction. I had the pleasure of being invited to to read it and and review it. Um, and um, Gabrielle is an incredible educator and um i think Hanukkah, you had mentioned um in our notes earlier eight about uh thinking through acemic writing um so writing that happens but it 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 kind of moves away from recognition um and it moves more into gesture um when we look at it on the page it's almost like painting um gabrielle is is kind of is doing this um, in this really gorgeous way. And um, I'll type her name into the chat. She's amazing. Um, and then also I'm uh, thinking about uh, a friend and also kind of a, a colleague in certain ways. I took a course with her last year, but um, the poet Miriam Yvette Parhizkar, 
who's just this amazing um, experimental poet working across language and um, and uh, through uh, uh, decompartmentalizing our colonial pasts and entanglements. And um, she's just so awesome. So I'll write the, their names in the chat too. Awesome. I will, um, when I send out an email to all of the attendees here today, I will be sure to include those names listed as well so that you have those for your reference. I'll also throw out two other poets, um, Vanessa Angelica Villarreal, book Beast Meridian is gorgeous and was published some astonishing poetry exploring form um, recently uh, online and Rushi Vias, whose first book just came out with, oh, was it Night Boat maybe? Oh no, it's called uh, When I Reach for Your Pulse and it's a very beautiful book about um, grief and um, yeah, and it's just, it was just recently published last month. So those are my, <laughs> my recommendations um, too, but I'll add those to the list also. Um, and other than that, thank you again, everyone for being here. Thank you so much for this wonderful conversation. I'm so grateful you all could gather and share. Um, thank you to Foglifter for, and thank you to our interpreters. Um, please check out San Mateo County Library's upcoming author talks at smcl.org slash author talks. We would also appreciate it if you could tell us how SMCL did with this event tonight at smcl.org slash rate this event. Any kind words you say, I'll make sure to pass on to our panelists as well. Um, have a wonderful night, everyone. Thank you.